All right. With that being said, I'd like to hand the presentation off to Jeremy Duncan. All right. Hey, thanks, Tyrone. Um, uh, thanks for joining my little webinar here. Um, I, I, I threw this out there as a, as a tool that I wanted to talk about because there's a there's some things in the enterprise IT world uh, that we really wanted to kind of discuss, especially when it comes to using network simulation testing and things like that. So what I'll be going over is, is, a, is a tool called EVE NG or Emulated Network Environment Next Generation. Um, and it's, and it's going to go through basically how network simulation testing and things like that you can do from uh, basically from, you know, a contained resource. So with that, so one of the things I wanted to talk about is to go over, you know, what is the te testing conundrum, right? What, what are we, you know, what are we trying to solve? What's the problem we're trying to solve here? And then really, what is EVNG? Um, and then from that point, we'll go into a live demo. So I have I have EVNG on set up on, a, on an infrastructure that actually has uh, a lot of the images that you'll see, and I'll and I'll run through those um, in in some detail here. So really, the the conundrum, right? The testing conundrum, right? Is we have a problem in the enterprise IT community where people do testing in production. They don't mean to do testing in production. In fact, they may even have a test lab uh, or a test infrastructure, but they still end up doing testing in production because they don't have an identical or at least a representative infrastructure in which to do testing, whether it be for software, hardware, uh, network devices, firewall rules, um, uh, uh, spanning tree, um, uh, networking protocols like routing or even IPv6. So that's the problem that we have right now, and really why we why this is kind of a big big deal is that I wanted to kind of show a tool you can use to do that testing, so you don't have to do it in production. So what is the real? I mean, everybody wants to test in a test lab, right? So um, the problem is that some of these physical lab uh, reproductions aren't always available, and what I mean by that is is that you you know may not actually have the tools that you need inside the lab to do the testing. So you may not have the routers, you may not have the switches, you may not even have a representation of those switches or routers or firewalls or you know infrastructure components, software uh, applications, things like that. Uh, what else, right? You may not have the full capabilities of production, meaning you may not have the full capabilities for doing you know, high availability disaster recovery testing, uh, especially when it comes to firewall rules or IPS, IDS signatures and things like that, that you would have. You, you're not necessarily gonna have that full capability in your, in your lab. And a lot of times, and this is you know, when it really comes down to it, in enterprise IT budgets are very, very uh, tight, right? And they're only gonna get tighter as as enterprise IT gets smaller and smaller as far as a footprint is concerned. So when that comes down to it, you're not going to have, in fact, as the future rolls around, you're not going to have the capability for more testing or more devices in a lab. It just isn't going to happen. So, um, you know, you really need a place in which to do that in an economical way. And then the last point is you may not have full access, right? So you may have a fully representative and fully stocked test lab uh, for your network production infrastructure, but you may not even have access, right? Or you only have access to a piece or a part of it, but you need an access to the full infrastructure. So where that comes in is even G. And so like I talked about, it's a built emulated virtual environment next generation. So think of it as like uh, GNS3. Uh, or even before that, the Dynamips world, right? So GNS3, um, you know, was basically a system that you can pull in images like routers, firewalls, and some switches. Um, it wasn't very user-friendly. Uh, in fact, it was really just uh, a basic little GUI on top of Dynamips and Dynagen. Um, you know, moving on that, right, the UI is very similar to something like Viral or uh, 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 basically what Cisco's uh, basically emulated router environment looks like. Uh, the problem is, is that Viral is Cisco pretty much uh, as far as networking infrastructure components are concerned. Now, of course, you can have servers, hosts, and things like that, but uh, the idea is the network infrastructure is all Cisco. 
So what EvenG offers is basically a platform or an infrastructure, if you will, to pull in all of these virtual appliance from all of the leading routing, switching, security, and server vendors that are out there. So um, this is a full list right here, and let me uh, let me open that up here so you can see that. A full list, in fact, if you go to the EvenG website, you can see this here, and it's a full list of all of the images that are supported from you know, your standard Dynamip stuff that was out there from the old days um, to all of your iOS stuff to all of your Kimu. Kimu is just another word for, you know, Linux KVM. So you're basically your virtual appliances. So you have all of the litany of Cisco. You have all of Juniper. You have stuff from Alcatel, Aruba, Arista, Barracuda, Checkpoint. Um, you know, basically the list goes on F5, uh, Palo Alto, Riverbed, you know, anything Windows, um, you even have PFSense and a huge stockpile of open source and uh, you know free systems that you can pull into. So if you can look at anything that a, a, an enterprise IT shop would probably have in an infrastructure, you'll have it here and the capability to pull into your environment. So you know when you when you look at this later, I would just click that link, click around and look around uh, the website and you can see exactly you know how you know, how, how many systems are actually supported in there. So really this comes down to, you're creating a lab and a box. So think of it as like, I've got a really souped up server that I, that I have sitting in my infrastructure that's not being used or it used to be used for something else that was decommissioned because it's maybe end of support. You know, this is, this is that's a good platform to actually throw EVNG on top of. Uh, you can also run it inside Google, uh, Google Cloud. They actually have a, uh, uh, a whole infrastructure support section that de deals with how to use GCP and EVNG. The problem with, with doing that, it doesn't work very well. I don't recommend it. Um, and it's mainly because you're doing nested virtualization. So this is where, you know, you're already doing virtualization with these virtual images and these virtual servers, uh, routers and switches. Um, well, you're doing it again because it's an image that runs on top of a another virtual image. So uh, again, I don't really recommend it. Performance is not very, very good at all. Um, and if you're looking at, you know, trying to do more on things with IPv6, GCP still doesn't have any IPv6 support uh, inside of their VPC routing. So that's, you know, that's a strike against them. So really, uh, the best place to do this is on a bare metal box. That's, if, if I were to recommend this, you know, across the board, um, bare metal is, is the key um, to getting the best performance that you can. Now, it's not to say that you can't run it in a virtual environment, and there's, there is a suitable way to do that in a cloud-based bare metal environment, um, but um, you know that's about the the cloudiest I would say that I re I recommend using uh, using EVNG. So really, the bare minimum on that is is using like four processors. Uh, you know, with hyperthreading, that gives you about eight virtual CPUs up to about 64 gigs of RAM. Uh, storage is not a big deal. It's not that big of a deal on storage. You know, you, you could get away with a terabyte or even less. Uh, the big deal is obviously when it comes to, you know, running running memory and uh, uh, processing power. So this is not something you can run in something like virtual uh, VMware workstation or virtual box. So um, the good capabilities of that, right? So if there's stuff that you don't like tapping on a screen or even, you know, you know, uh, using the GUI itself, there's actually a, a, an API that you can use. And again, when, I, when we go back to the website, right, you can see uh, a how-to section and it actually goes through the API itself. So you can see, you know, how to use the API, it's standard, uh, standardized JSON, uh, you know, commands that you can use. So everything from authenticating to, you know, system status to bringing up and shutting off users or uh, systems or adding new, uh, ser servers and systems and things like that, which is also I do recommend this web page to, to look at. Uh, it has a whole how-to section, and these are how-to to pull in all of these virtual appliances, which is one of those limitations that that that, that you that you need to obviously be concerned with, um, unless you're using it in something like a, a, a Cloud My Lab, which is one instance of EVNG, uh, where it has all of the instances of all of these servers and appliances, you really have to bring your own licenses um, and you have to bring your own virtual instances. So all those how-to sections actually talk about 
okay, now you have the virtual appliance, how do you bring it into EVNG and, and use it uh, effectively? So there's a lot of open source images available that you can get without having to pay for. Um, but again, if you're using something like Cisco CSR 1000V, um, if you're using an evaluation license, it limits you at 100 kilobits per second data rate. So it's just not something you can run um, production unless you have, of course, the licenses to bring with that if you're trying to do performance space tests and things like that. Um, the other limitation really is, you know, the community version. There's two versions, right? There's a pro and then there's a community. And I'm going to demonstrate the community here in a second. The community version, which is the open source free version that you can run uh, without having to pay for anything. Um, really gives you only one lab with one user. Um, and again, if you're just trying to test and do some network emulation and not trying to do too much, um, you know, this is this is all you really need. Now, the pro version adds to that capability, right? So having uh, having a capability for more users, for, for more simultaneously running labs and things like that. So that again, uh, you you have to pay for that one. And I think the I think the going rate on a pro on pro is about I think it's about a thousand dollars every year, and it's a it's a yearly subscription that you're basically paying for that or yearly licensing. So without further ado, um, I want to walk through the demo here. So this is kind of like an basically a screenshot of basically what we're going to be looking at here. What I want to do is I want to walk through the UI. I want to add some nodes and networks, and you can kind of see how that looks. Uh, some of the wiring. Uh, show you how to do you know basically packet captures as you're doing testing between nodes and things like that and then some of the examples of what the api will actually give you so let me uh pull this up here so this is our topology here like i discussed here right so the the tested topology that we're going to walk through is this right here right so we have basically a, a simulated system of running a, a border router uh, server switch that border router is that cisco csr 1000 v um, we're using, say, a Cisco 9000 uh, series switch, and it has a virtual appliance for that as well. So the whole Nexus virtual switch, if you will. And then we're, we're running an Ubuntu uh, 1604 web server. So we'll, we'll run that. And then we also have a client here that we're going to actually test to actually test in routing to get to our web server and actually test the web functionality of IPv4 and IPv6. So you can see the clients and you can basically add text. To your to your lab here and these all of these nodes around here move and are very flexible to move around as far as the infrastructure concerned so it's one of those things that you can pull together right one of those things to keep in mind is that you have a management network that you can actually cli directly into the things that are connected to your management network uh, so what we're using here is a 10.90.70/24 management network so i could I could SSH or even Telnet if I needed to uh, into these specific devices as well along that when those connections are made. So one thing to keep in mind is when you're making connections between devices inside of EVE, you have to remember the two things that are connected have to be in a shut, shut off state. Uh, that, that Unless you're, of course, connecting to a network, you don't necessarily have to be in a shut off state on the network side. So for example, I have this Kali Linux client that I'm using um, and I need to connect it because I'm going to do this testing. It has to be in a shut off state in order to, to actually wire it in. So here's here basically how it is. You should basically choose the network interface that you have. And this is a Kali Linux, basically a GUI based system. Uh, I'm sure everyone on the on the bridge is very familiar with Kali Linux um, and you connect it and it actually will connect to its cloud interface. So this is basically an interface that, that I'm going to show when I connect to these resources um, that we can actually do packet captures and see sniffing between here and the systems along our lab. So, so you've connected it and now you want to actually start it up. It's a pretty easy thing. You just right click on it and then you go to start. And the system will, will go through a, a boot up process as you obviously can see here. And, and basically what happens is that you go through a process where it opens up a almost like a what they what it's called basically a guacamole uh, interface which is like a console interface that you have directly into the systems so you can have a console interface directly into each of these systems when they're in a powered on state all you do have to do is you click into it when you're using the html5 uh, basically interface and you can 
basically click into and, and actually get into each of your images via the console. So it's like a serial console that you'll have from that standpoint. So as we can see, we're, we're, we, we, have our, uh, we have our Eve NG set up here, um, or I mean our, our Kali Linux, it's basically in a boot, back to a boot up state, right? So what some of the many, many things inside the UI that you can do is you can add other nodes. Um, and that's basically what you do, a right click and do add new node, right? You can look through and you, these are all of the different types of systems that you can obviously build into and add into your environment. Again, if they're grayed out, which means it doesn't have an, an image associated with your uh, even, even G instance, uh, you can obviously go through a process like I discussed in the, the how-to section here, which is all of these different types of things where I wanted to bring in these images. It goes through the instructions of, so now you have the image, how do you install the image into the infrastructure that you can use it um, again within EVE. So I go back in here and one of the things is I want to add like a Cisco ASAV. Uh, you can obviously tweak the amount of, of, of CPU that you want to use. It gives you defaults that you can use um, as well as the amount of Ethernet interfaces that you end up using. And then you just click save. And what it does is it, it'll pinpoint it in there in a shut off state. And from this point, you can go in and actually wire up these systems to your infrastructure, of course. So has all the different kinds of interfaces. So this is, again, so think of the ASA 1000V or the ASA V, which is basically an ASA firewall. Um, and, you know, I'm gonna connect in things like, you know, I'm gonna connect in things like my management to my management network here. You basically go down to your management zero zero and you connect it. So, and from there, obviously you can power up things, you can go in there and, and do things. So. You know, basically that's the, uh, you know, basically that's kind of walking through uh, how to add a node. We also have networks, right? So you see these little clouds, these are basically networks. So these are actually virtual networks. They're bridge networks on the actual server that you're running uh, even G on. So if I were to add a network in here, it has different network types. So this goes into uh, your management cloud, which is what we had kind of discussed there. But it also, each of these things that say cloud and then a number are actually referring to a bridged interface that's actually uh, on your actual physical <laughs> server itself. So if you wanted to do things like, you know, do packet captures and things like that, those are those are things that you can use inside of your, uh, basically your, your system. So what we have here that says cloud is actually, if we, you can go in there and edit it, it's actually pulling, do, it, or connecting to cloud nine, which is actually a, a bridged interface inside of our system. So when we do our testing, we can actually have a, uh, basically a sniffer that runs here and actually can, you know, look through and, and obviously sniff the packets as we're going through in tests. So, you know, that's kind of basically how you, you know, pull that, pull that all together. Um, so as we go back into our, you know, our Kali Linux system here, again, this is basically like, uh, you know, looking at a, a VGA, a VGA monitor or, or whatnot, basically the console itself of the uh, graphical user interface for the Kali Linux system. So as it's coming inside, as it's you know coming online, we'll, we're going to do a few tests, uh, you know, to kind of test out the infrastructure that we we you know talked about here. So my goal here in this little simple simple test that it did here is that I want to ensure I have <clears throat> routing and I can actually have reachability over IPv6 and IPv4 to my web server that's sitting in my DMZ. Um, so I'm gonna do a few trace routes and then I'm also going to connect to the web UI uh, for the web server itself. So as you can see, we have um, inside of the topology, if I go back to the topology here, you have these little text windows that you can put in there to help you to find out, you know, obviously you're not gonna know everything from all the, all the IP sitting anywhere. So you put text windows in there and you can actually connect to them and things like that. So I know I can run, say, a trace route. And basically, if you're not familiar with what a trace route is, it's basically, um, you know, base, basically a way to test the routing along the way. Obviously, if firewalls aren't filtering it along the way. And you can see, you know, uh, each of the points of the network that you're actually you know, touching. So 10.255.255.11 is actually the web server that I am connecting to from my client that is out here on the external part of the network. So I'm basically gonna do a trace route from, from that point, and we're gonna see it, it go through 
its progression through the network. So as you can see, it's hitting 192.168.10.1, which is actually the gateway that we hit, which is that CSR 1000B. And then we hit 10.255.255.2, uh, which is actually the uh, Cisco Nexus. It's actually running as a layer three switch as well. And then obviously our endpoint here, 10.255.11. Obviously, you can do the same thing with 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 uh, IP6 as well. And this basically the network that we're using to connect. Oops. And we'll uh, do the same thing with uh, obviously with IPv6 as well. So you can see it's going to hop through each, each of its gateways along the way. And uh, you know, basically at that point we get there. So. Um, so we've basically got a trace route through our infrastructure. All right, and one thing, the last point I wanted that I'm going to do during my little test here is I'm going to connect to the the web server, and I'm going to go with its uh, actual literal IPv6 address, and I can I can see that I can actually connect to uh, the web server and pull down my all my different memes on my little web server. So that again, this is a, an infrastructure system that basically you can set in. And all of these servers, client side, uh, graphical interfaces are all part of what you can do with uh, EVNG. So that's basically that part of it here. Um, so let's say uh, I, I wanted to look at captures, right? So if there was a system, so I have this cloud, right, that we had talked about. Now I'm on my CLI here, uh, which is basically just I SSH'd into the Eve server itself, and I can I can run a TCP dump. Uh, on that actual network interface that we had, that we were looking at here, right? So this is PNet one or PNet nine, which is actually the the network cloud connection point that you see right here. So I can do I can do sniffing between those connections uh, along the way. So as you can see here, I'm going to go and uh, test again. I want to test again, you know, the IPv6 hit of the of the website, and I can see the packets of IPv6, you know, obviously going through my get requests and things like that along the way. So it's good. It's a good tool to obviously help with, you know, network packets or uh, captures and things like that along the way for sniffing and things like that. So, um, and the last part uh, here I wanted to demonstrate was the API. So as we discussed, right, this is the community version, which means this only allows me to have you know, one login, right? So I have one user account to log in. So once I log in through the API, it is going to uh, disconnect me uh, via the uh, 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 the web UI. So as you can see, I got disconnected here, uh, but I am now connected via the web UI. So I can do things like uh, uh, look at, you know, specific status of the system, and I'm actually hitting it via curl. Uh, specifically a web API. Obviously, if you use Burp Suite or anything else that you wanted to use as far as, you know, API testing or API usage, uh, it does have all of that capability that, again, we discussed inside of that how-to section uh, that's included here. So if you go down to the how-to section, you can see uh, right at the bottom here, it talks to the API, and it actually goes through each of the JSON commands that you can run uh, within your systems to actually uh, list things out, look at status, all the way down to adding new nodes um, and, um, you know, shutting down nodes, starting up nodes, all of those things that, that allows for, you know, that connection in to your, uh, to your EVE instance. So when you log into EVE, you have to make sure that you're using the HTML, HTML5 console. Um, that's because, you know, that guacamole interface that I showed you when we're looking at it from the Kali Linux side here, that's basically how it how it connects to the console itself. All right, so that that kind of runs down uh, kind of a down and dirty of uh, you know how this you know we put this together. Um, last thing I wanted to talk about on the 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 this itself here is let me share my screen. My other part is here. Let's say you have more than one even even instance. Uh, this isn't really a supported configuration or really a standard configuration with any e Eve, meaning, um, <clears throat> you know, they obviously don't have a way for you to connect in and uh, an easy way to connect and point and connect all your little Eve instances because you're likely not going to have a supercomputer that can run all of your all of your lab infrastructure off of one lab, 
uh, inside of Eve, especially if you're using you know older server images decommissioned or older server hardware and things like that that's de been decommissioned. So uh, an easy way in which we've found in the past is it actually just use basic GRE tunneling that's native within Linux, right? So you know you can easily script this on each of your Eve instances. So if you've got an Eve instance, uh, for example, uh, you know I have one that's you know, sitting on these specific IPs, as you can see, it's running uh, a GRE tunnel between the two of them. And this is a simple, uh, you know, bash script that you can run. Again, this will be in the, the PDF that you'll be able to download if you want to look at this and feel free to use it, obviously. And you're going to basically just set up a, a GRE tunnel. And it's, again, native within your Ubuntu Linux image that you have set up on EVNG uh, to do this. And you can set that up and obviously, you know, have your connections between the two. So, that was an example of when I was in here, I had a cloud set up right here. This is actually a, a, a node or a cloud. I can actually connect nodes to communicate with other nodes in another Eve instance, right? So this is basically a way in which, you know, you only have your constrained by, you know, resources for CPU and memory. Uh, you're gonna need to obviously, you know, connect other instances, or let's just say you have another site, right? And you wanna connect, you wanna wanna actually show how to do disaster recovery and you wanna test the disaster recovery, um, you know, between your Eve instances and things like that. You can do that, of course, uh, by connecting it that way. Again, that's not really supported, um, you know, configuration, but it is something that we have used in the past uh, to, uh, you know, obviously uh, help, you know, with, with, with that. So other than that, um, that basically concludes the uh, demo and uh, 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 PowerPoint uh, slideshow that I had uh, set up. I guess, uh, Tyrell, we can go through some, uh, through some questions. Yes, there was a couple of questions. The first being, with the recommendation of 64 gigs of RAM, how does one approach this with something like 16 gigs or is that even possible i mean it's possible right um so you, you you're 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 looking at scale here right so let's just say you have a few the minimum is the minimum that your server can can run right so i could run you know one gigabit one gigabyte ram um you know you know two cpus or one cpu you know two virtual cpus on the system and then it would run uh, the Eve instance would run, um, but when you when you actually look at it, right? So there's an actual status window that you can look at here on the Eve uh, system itself, and you can see um, I've got a huge amount of memory that's sitting on this system, and I'm already running at three percent. So if I'm so if I basically look at uh, CPU, oop, oh, that one, uh, CPU. You can see that my system here is actually running with 80 CPUs. So I'm already at a percent, which is what I have running right there. Um, so I don't, it's not really recommended uh, if you have a small amount of memory. And then on the memory that we have right here was about 500 and about 500 and so gigabytes of memory that we, we actually have running on this system itself. So this is a pretty massive system that we have um, that we've been running testing on and things like that. But uh, Again, you can run it on the smallest amount. Just remember, you're going to get the performance that you're putting into it. So, uh, lower memory means, you know, it's going to mean it's going to be lower performance. Okay. And there was a follow-up question: Can you save your network architecture for extended testing sessions? You mean like uh, saving the lab itself? Yes. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> basically, the lab itself is set up this way. Um, you can. When you put it in here, it, it all, all, always is going to be saved. So if you shut the server off and power it back on, everything is going to be saved in the server structure. Again, if you have a pro, you can add more than one lab. So in, in the community version, right, you can only have one lab. Uh, now, as you have these systems in here, obviously they, they use uh, NVRAM to store their st startup configurations. So um, or you know whatever they're using for storage, whether the virtual appliance, the chemo images, things like that, uh, or else they're all persistent, right? You can do things like mess around with starter configs for your network devices, right? You can do things like actually, you know, pull off and export starter configs for your system. So let's just say, for example, you were running, uh, you know, a network test from 
all of these different images that you have in your infrastructure and you want to run that in in your lab with identical configurations you can actually import those identical configurations into your system here um, and and actually run through this specific tests that you want to run through all those images uh, and then if you obviously had changes that you had to make or anything like that you could export those out and put them in your production if you needed to so um, it does have that capability uh, there is obviously more features that are associated with the pro version than there are with the community version Okay, I don't see any more questions. Um, please, please, everyone, if you have anything that you would like to ask Jeremy, now is the time. We'll give it another 15 or 20 seconds or so. If not, we'll close out. Did everyone get the handout? Which was the slides? Okay. And again, if you need to talk to me offline, or if you need to get me directly, right? So this is the these are the two Twitter handles that, that I'm that I'm on usually, um, or okay. hit, hit me up on the, on email address here or okay. our website. We have four more more questions actually. So okay. does it support Ubiquity or Sonic Wall? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, let me let me actually pull up our the supported images that they have in here. So uh, or Unify. Sonic Wall. Say again. Uh, Sonic Wall, Unify, Ubiquity. So it does have support for Sonic Wall. So you do have that support for Sonic Wall. I haven't seen anything for uh, Ubiquity as far as like the, you know, wireless access points, I assume, or the wireless uh, wireless controllers and things like that. They do have Cisco wireless controllers, but obviously that's not uh, uh -huh. specific for what you were looking for um, in that question, I'm sure. But no, it doesn't seem like we they have a supported configuration for you, Ubiquity. That doesn't necessarily mean it does it won't work. Um, but you just obviously they don't have a how to and how to actually pull it into it. So Okay. Do you see many non commercial folks using this? Non commercial, what do you mean? Um I guess uh folks that aren't at the enterprise level. Oh yeah, absolutely. So people who are, you know, working on their CCNA or CCIE and they just okay. don't have an infrastructure to test on they get a little lab box and, and run Eve on it and they can pull all of their you know uh, networks together uh, or all of their test configurations together for their for training and things like that as nice. well as obviously labbing out scenarios right so um, you know since it has so many of the components within the network infrastructure you can pull things together and actually lab out what, what you have okay uh, quick question for me. What are some of your personal favorite features about Eve and G? I, I like its flexibility. Um, it, you know, if you're not running with enough memory, uh, it will be frustrating for you. So um, and that's why I, I wanted to kind of, you know, preface it off the top that if you, you need to have a beefy, beefy box to really run this, right? So this is not something that you would run on a Raspberry Pi or anything like that. Uh, I think it's possible you could actually run it on a Raspberry Pi, but you're not going to get the kind of performance that you need to, nor will it will it actually be any use of use for you. Um, so I definitely like the flexibility and the usage of it uh, in that, you know, they do have all of these supported, uh, community supported ways in which to pull in all of these different images. And they're updating them as they, they have, and they actually have a live help desk. that's actually a Slack channel you can communicate on, and they're actually pretty responsive as far as, you know, if you if you run into any issues or there's any problems, there's usually somebody on there within, you know, five minutes that can, you know, can get with you. And of course, obviously, you know, virtually everything that's open source, they have that support or they have a capability to import that stuff in. So. Does that answer your question? Very nice. Yes, it does. <laughs> Uh, I think this is the last one about the beefy, beefy box. Are we talking an actual server with maxed out RAM with two physical processors? Guess so, we're referring to yours. Okay. So um, specifically, they're referring to mine. What do you mean? So when you mentioned that your box was pretty beefy, um, I guess they were asking to be a little bit more specific. Yeah, actually, this, is, uh, this was actually four... Uh, this was actually four processors running, um, what's the number? It ended up being about 40 cores total. 
so you could get 40 cores out of it. it was a it was actually a Dell server that, that we bought off of uh, Save My Server. Um, okay. And you can, basically they they're uh, you know kind of like remanufactured or what they call a re, uh, refurbished <laughs> systems that you can right. buy a lot cheaper than you would get like on the I guess it's called the secondary secondary market and things like that. Okay, what um, was that? What's the name of that again? It's called Save My Server. Okay. Uh, they're, they're they're a pretty good operation um, that you know, basically will build out uh, refurbished parts or secondary parts in into a server based on specific configurations that you put in there. So uh -huh. this was a this was a refurbished Dell server that was running four processors. So these are actually four physical processors <laughs> that run with a total of forty cores. So you end up with a you know a, a full capability of virtu of eighty virtual CPUs. Um, and 512 gigabytes of RAM. So okay. pretty large beefy box that'll run this. Uh, it's, you're not gonna have any issues if you're running something like that. You can run it obviously less than that, right? Um, you know, there's there's also, you know, the the the, uh, the, the systems of using things like, uh, you know, Cloud My Server. I, I spoke to that a little bit earlier. Let me, uh, let me uh, pull that up here. That was actually, uh, do, do, do. it was cloud my server. I think that's what it was called. No, not that's not what it's called. I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. But okay. it's basically, a, you know, a virtual environment that'll that actually hosts uh, Eve instances, uh, you know, for people who who want to do it on and pay basically pay for it on an hourly basis. Oh, okay. Cool. Yep. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Claire, I hope I said that name right. Uh, Claire's on a roll, essentially, uh, just trying to figure out what a monthly, what the monthly cost would be to run something like this on, on a, I guess you can you can call it a, a higher than normal uh, server infrastructure when it comes to processing and. Yeah, so uh, that's the other one. Uh, in fact, I talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, let's go back here. Uh, Vulture, which is actually a cloud-based bare metal system uh, that you can run, and it runs fairly well. Uh, you know, with a a pretty medium medium grade amount of of images that you have in the infrastructure, it'll actually run. Um, and it's it's I think it's like uh, yep, it's eight CPUs you you have on the bare metal box. Um, with up to 32 gigabytes of, of RAM. And that's a good a good amount of actually being able to run in, you know, in, when I say cloud-based bare metal, it seems like it's two things against each other. It's just, it's a cloud-managed bare metal system. So they have auto provisioning to where you can actually spin up uh, bare metal actual boxes and it will run, and then you can run um, EVE basically on those bare metal boxes. And they run um, as far as the cost on those for the bare metal. I think it was uh, about it was about one hundred and thirty dollars up to one hundred and thirty dollars a month. So um, you know if this if it's not something to where you would have the capability to running you know systems right, you can scale that up and down as you you know see fit. But it's about one hundred and thirty dollars a month per uh, bare metal box. So it's an hourly cost, but if you're running it per month, it's it's usually about one to one hundred and twenty to one hundred and thirty or so. Does that answer your question, or were you looking for something else? Uh, I believe that answers it. So that looks like the very last question. Um, it looks like one just popped up about working on AWS if we already have bare metal on their systems. Uh, this does not run on AWS. Um, you, you could run. Uh, if you could run nested systems on AWS, which you can, again, I talked about how there was a supported configura configuration for GCP, but again, you're you're doing nested virtualization. And what I mean by that is, is that you have all of these router images and all of these, you know, virtual appliances are running as virtual appliances on your physical um, Eve instance. But if you're running on virtual Eve instances, basically you have to use nested virtualization. And what I mean by that is that the cloud hosting provider actually has to pass through, uh, you know, the uh, CPU uh, to use on the hardware itself. So some of those don't support it. I don't think AWS has support for nested virtualization. I'm not 100% sure on that one. 
Google does, um, and it's just because we had experience with using it before. Um, they've been playing around with actually pulling that capability back um, because again, you know, you're you're using basically your images to tap directly into the hardware, right? And it has to do that, right? To run these things effectively to where they're actually running in a, in a capability, right? So you got to think these are firewalls, these are servers, these are switches that are using, you know, they're using heavy on the RAM, heavy on the CPU. They need to tap directly into the hardware to actually run, you know, forwarding and things like that. So um, AWS, I don't believe so. GCP, yes, but I don't recommend it. Okay, sounds great. Uh, that is all the questions. I want to thank everyone for coming out. Jeremy, I want to thank you for giving the presentation. As always, we'd love to have you. You can see Jeremy's contact info. There will be a follow-up uh, email as well containing how to get in touch with Jeremy in case you missed this. The video will be posted on the website and on our YouTube channel, and then you'll also receive a copy of this video uh, in the follow-up email in case you missed anything. All right, so again, thank you for coming out. We did release the registration for next week's uh, presentation. It will be me giving our quarterly talk about breaking into cyber. So if that is something that you're interested in, please register or uh, <clears throat> you know spread the word. All right, so again, thank you all for coming out and we'll see you all next week. Have a good day.